What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with Elder Ulysses Suarez was given on November 5th, 2013. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to our devotional this morning. We will have the privilege of hearing from Elder Ulysses Suarez, a member of the Presidency of the Seventy. We especially welcome Sister Suarez, who is seated on the stand. Elder Suarez was named a member of the Presidency of the Seventy in January of this year. He has served as President of the Brazil area as well as Counselor in several areas. Elder Suarez received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Accounting and Economics in 1985. Later, he received his MBA. His professional career has included being an accountant and an auditor for a multinational corporation in Brazil and serving as the Director of Temporal Affairs for the Church in the Brazil area in Sao Paulo, Brazil. At the time of his call to be a general authority, he was on a training assignment for physical facilities and welfare services for the Church in Salt Lake City. Elder Suarez has many years of Church service. He was a full-time missionary in the Brazil Rio de Janeiro mission and served as president of the Portugal Porto Mission. He and his wife, Rosanna Fernandes, are the parents of three children. And now we'll have the opportunity of hearing from Elder Ulysses Suarez. I'm very grateful for the privilege to be with you today. It is a great opportunity to speak to a very special and unique group of people like you. It's truly a blessing to study at this university, a place that allows each of you to live according to your beliefs. Not all students in the world have this opportunity. When I was at your age, I studied at a respected university in Sao Paulo, Brazil, in the city where I was born and raised. It was a good institution of higher education, but it didn't have any environment as healthy as you have here. I didn't have the wonderful support structure like BYU has. Furthermore, he didn't have a single other student who shared the same principles of the gospel that I had. To the contrary, I had many peers who tried to influence me in a direction that was different from where I wanted to go. So I can assure you, you are truly very blessed to have this privilege. So enjoy it. I'm certain you have already heard about Michelangelo, the Italian sculptor, an Italian we say, in Italian we say Michelangelo. Besides being a sculptor, he was a painter, a poet, an architect, and it is considered one of the foremost artists of Western civilization during the period of the Renaissance to Mannerism. He is very known as a genius for his large marble status made, made in his uh, century. He was born in Italy in 1475, and he lived there most of his life and left an artistic legacy for humanity, and it is admired even today. One of his most famous sculptures is called the Pietà. This statue portrays the scene of Mary, the mother of Jesus, seated with Jesus Christ, her son, laying in her arms after having been taken down from the cross. Mary's countenance expresses profound sadness for the suffering that she experienced, and the face of Jesus expresses the suffering he had accumulated after having borne the, other, the arduous burden of taking upon him the sins of the world and being nailed to the cross. It is a work of art that depicts the authenticity of the physical and emotional details of a scene of suffering. I had a privilege of viewing this sculpture during a visit I made in the St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican. I was even more impressed to learn that Michelangelo used basically two main tools to accomplish his works of art, a hammer and a chisel. It is truly incredible to imagine how someone could create such an enormous and beautiful work of art from a piece of raw marble using only these two tools. 
Certainly, he was very talented and knew how to use the resources he had to produce such beautiful works of art. When I think about the work he produced <clears throat> and the result he achieved, figuratively, I think about the wonderful plan of love our Heavenly Father developed in consideration for each of us and for what he hoped we might become when he sent us here to earth. Each of us born, was born with the potential to become like our Heavenly Father. Through our experiences and by properly using our agency, we can turn our lives in the direction of God and become like Him. Or we can be distracted by the world and fail to achieve our potential as it was promised to us. Figuratively, we all have the potential to become beautiful works of art in the Lord's hands. In this sense, this is the sculpture, and he uses a hammer and a chisel to mold us through our experiences day by day. If we allow the Lord to shape us, the result will be wonderful. But without question, this world offers many distractions that can pull out our focus away from the primary reason why we are living here on this earth. These distractions can turn into detours in our lives that prevent us from being transformed into works of art. Let's examine how this happens. But before speaking about this process, I wish to emphasize two principles. First, you need to know that you are a chosen generation. You are preordained by the Lord to be here on earth during this period of history. The Lord reserved all of you for this time because He knew that you would be part of a group of special and strong spirits who could overcome the challenges of this era. Therefore, you are a special generation. I'm certain that you have already heard that many times, but can you see now why? Second, the enemy knows your potential and the promises made to you. He was in the presence of the Lord when this plan was presented. He knows exactly what the Lord expects for, for each of us. He doesn't have the veil of forgiveness as we do while we live upon the earth. For this reason, He works so hard to distract our attention from our primary focus, trying to draw us away from the direction of the Lord. Now going back about the process of distractions. I would like to refer to Lehi's vision about the tree of life. Remember that Lehi saw a tree whose fruit was very desirable to make one happy. He also saw a straight and narrow path alongside an iron rod that extended along the bank of a river leading to the field where the tree was located. A dense mist of darkness covered the path leading to the tree of life. Because of this mist, Several people who had started along the path to the tree of life wandered away from it and became lost. In 1 Nephi chapter 12, verse 17, Nephi explains that the mists of darkness are the temptations of the devil that blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the children of men, leading them into broad roads where they perish and are lost. Here we find the primary distraction in our lives. Temptation. The guide of the descriptors defined temptation as a test of a person's ability to choose good instead of evil, an enticement to sin, and follow Satan instead of God. Temptation is the primary weapon that the enemy uses to distract us. According to the teachings of Nephi, temptation makes us blind, hardens our heart, and causes us to perish. Generally speaking, temptation is very subtle. It comes to us undetected and deceives us. We are unable to see the consequences of it, and consequently we may choose wrong. We become blind. We become prideful with a hardened heart, unreceptive to the will of God. The only weapon we have to avoid this distraction is to hold on the iron rod. Nephi explained this to his brothers when they asked him about the meaning of the iron rod. Nephi said, quote, And I said unto them that it was the word of God, and whose would hearken unto the word of God, and would hold fast unto it, 
they would never perish, neither could the temptations and the fiery darts of the adversary overpower them unto blindness, to lead them away to destruction. Wherefore I, Nephi, did exhort them to give heed unto the word of the Lord. Yeah, I did exhort them with all the energies of my soul and with all the faculty which I possessed, that they would give heed to the word of God and remember to keep his commandments always in all things." Close quote. I remember an experience that a young man <clears throat> went through during the, the years when he was in college. This young man was a good member of the church at that time. He told me that he was once invited to a costume party in the house of one of his classmates. Everyone was very excited to go to that particular party. The friend claimed that his college professors were also invited to attend it, especially some of them who were very nice and friendly towards the students. All of this seemed very inviting and secure, so the young man accepted the invitation to go to the party. When he arrived there, he realized that the atmosphere was not exactly what he had expected. There were students drinking, smoking, using drugs, and doing other horrible things in every corner of that house. He said that he became very concerned about what was happening and began to think about how he could leave that situation. The party was at a location far from his own home. He had gotten a ride with friends and so that he had no way to return home on his own. At that very moment, he prayed silently unto the Lord asking for help. After some pondering, he felt that he should walk outside the house. He followed his feelings and stayed outside the house until the party ended. That decision went unnoticed by his friends, who were all involved in that atmosphere and only regrouped when he, it was time to leave. During the ride home, his friends talked about the horrible things that had happened during that party. This young man felt very uncomfortable with the whole situation. It was not easy for him to bear it, but the next day he went to the sacrament meeting and partook of the sacrament. In that moment, he felt calm, peaceful, and certain that he had made the correct decision. In that moment, he realized what it means to grasp the iron rod and not let go even in the midst of the mists of darkness. He understood clearly what Nephi taught his brothers when he said that, whose would hearken unto the word of God and would hold fast unto it, they would never perish, neither could the temptations and the fire darts of the adversary overpower them unto blindness to lead them away to destruction. Imagine what might have happened if that young man, simply out, the shame, out of the shame, had not been strong enough to continue holding on to the iron rod. As a result of this and other decisions in his life, that young man married in the temple to a wonderful young woman, formed a special family, and has been very successful in his life in everything he has done. He serves faithfully in the church and seeks to be a good example to his children. It is not easy to face temptation daily. We are all exposed to an environment that is hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We live in a world that is deteriorating morally. Media and technology invite us to participate in destructive and life-shattering activities that are opposed to our beliefs and the values of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pressures from friends who do not share our principles or who share our principles but are weak in their faith push us to participate in degrading behaviors. And on the top of all this, we have to deal with the natural man that exists in each of us. The Guide to the Scriptures defines the natural man as a person who chooses to be influenced by the passions, desires, appetites, and senses of the flesh rather than by the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Such a person can comprehend physical things, but not spiritual things. All people are carnal or mortal because of the fall of Adam and Eve. 
Each person must be born again through the atonement of Jesus Christ to cease being a natural man. One year ago, Elder Paul V. Johnson, commissioner of the church educational system, said the following in this same pulpit, quote, part of our early earthly experience consists of being enticed by both good and evil, and then learning how to choose good over evil. How could we become like the Savior if we did not have agency to make those choices? By using agents to choose the right, individuals begin to put on the divine nature to pattern their lives after His. They find peace, happiness, and freedom as they make right choices. Satan will now deceive and blind men and lead them captive at His will. If He is leading people captive, doesn't that sound like he is destroying agency? The fact is, he could not destroy agency in the pre-earth life, and he cannot do it now either. If he can't destroy agents, then how could he lead us captive? He does it by enticing individuals to sin. When we sin, we subject ourselves to him. We, in effect, give part of our agency to him. We can't take it from us but we can relinquish it. When individuals yield to the temptation, they become subject to the will of the devil. When though, even though when he can't destroy or take away our agency by force, we can give it up." Close quote. There is a simple formula that President Monson taught that can help us avoid the distraction of temptation and keep us moving in the right direction. He said, you can't be right by doing wrong. You can't be wrong by doing right. President Monson's formula is simple and direct. If we exercise faith and are diligent in obeying the commandments of the Lord, we will easily find the right way to go when we face daily small choices and challenges. In that regard, President George Albert Smith taught, Quote, there is a line of demarcation well defined between the Lord's territory and the devil's territory. If you will stay on the Lord's side of the line, you will be under his influence and will have no desire to do wrong. But if you cross to the devil's side of that line one inch, you are in the tempter's power, and if he is successful, you will not be able to think or even reason properly because we have lost the spirit of the Lord." Close quote. Therefore, my dear youth, we should ask ourselves every day, are my actions placing me in the Lord's territory or the enemy's territory? I can't be right by doing wrong. I can't be wrong by doing right. So let's exa examine what the prophet Mormon taught his people regarding this same topic. Quote, Wherefore, I show unto you the way to judge, for everything which inviteth to do good and to persuade to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore, ye may know with a perfect knowledge it is of God. But whatever thing persuadeth man to do evil and believe not in Christ and deny him and serve not God, then ye may know with a perfect knowledge it is of the devil. For after this manner doth the devil work, for he persuaded no man to do good. No, not one, neither do his angels, neither do they who subject themselves unto him." Close quote. Our Heavenly Father has given us the light of Christ. The light of Christ is this divine energy, power or influence that proceeds from God, through Christ and give us life and light to all things. It helps a person choose between right and wrong. This wonderful gift, in conjunction with the companionship of the Holy Ghost, should help us to determine whether our manner of living is placing us in the territories of the Lord or that of the enemy. If our behavior is good, we are being inspired by God. For everything that is good comes from God. If our behavior is bad, we are being influenced by the enemy, for he persuades man to do what is wrong. 
That young man from the history I told you a moment ago used these two wonderful gifts. The light of Christ helped him to identify what was right, and the Holy Ghost guided his decision about what path he should follow. These two gifts are available to those who hold onto the iron rod. Now let's imagine that for some reason we have been de deceived or confused by temptation and we ended up sinning. What should we do? If we fall into temptation and sin, we have to reconcile ourselves with God. In the language of the scriptures, this means we must repent and change. Repentance is a change of mind and heart that brings a fresh attitude towards God, oneself and life in general. Repentance implies that a person turns away from evil and turns his heart and will to God, submitting to God's commandments and desires forsaking sin. True repentance comes from a love from God and a sincere desire to obey His commandments. I like very much what Elder Neil A. Anderson taught about repentance some years ago. He said, quote, When we sin, we turn away from God. When we repent, we turn back toward God. The invitation to repent is rarely a voice of chastisement, but rather a loving appeal to turn around and to return toward God. It is the back knowing of a loving father and his only begotten son to be more than we are, to reach up a higher way of life, to change, and to feel the happiness of keeping the commandments. We rejoice in the blessing of repenting and the joy of being forgiven. They become part of us, shaping the way we think and feel." Close quote. My dear young people, repentance is a wonderful gift which is available to all who desire to return to God. It is available to those who have the desire to hold unto the iron rod and allow the Lord to mold their lives into a wonderful work of art. Repentance allows the Lord to use a hammer and a chisel to shape our lives and make us into a beautiful work of art. We were born with the seed of divinity in our spirit because we are God's children. This seed needs to grow. It develops as we use our agency in righteousness, as we make correct decisions, as we use the light of Christ and the Holy Ghost to guide us in the decisions we make during the course of our lives. In this way, we shape our spirits so they become an admirable work of art. This process takes time. Michelangelo was 13 years old when he began his art artistic activities as an apprentice in Italy. He followed his master's teachings, and for more than 70 years of his life, he produced works of art admired around the world. Like Michelangelo, we need to understand that it is not possible to shape our lives from one day to another. Our choices shape our souls. Recognizing our dedication and perseverance, the Lord will give us what we are unable to obtain by ourselves. He will shape us with His hammer and cheese, chisel because He sees our efforts to overcome our imperfections and human weaknesses. In that regard, repentance becomes part of our daily lives. Our weekly taking of the sacrament is so important to come meekly, humbly before the Lord, acknowledging our dep dependence upon Him, asking Him to forgive and renew us, and promising to always remember Him. Sometimes, in our daily efforts to become more Christ-like, we find ourselves repeatedly struggling with the same difficulties. It is as we were climbing a tree-covered mountain. At times, we don't see our progress until we get closer to the top and look back from the, the high ridges. Please don't be discouraged. If you are striving and working to repent, then you are in the process of repenting, the process of changing. Elder D. Todd Christofferson stated that, quote, overcoming bad habits often means an effort today followed by another tomorrow and then another, perhaps for many days, 
even months and years until we achieve victory, close quote. As we improve, we see life more clearly and feel the Holy Ghost working more strongly within us. For those who are truly repentant but seem unable to feel relief, continue keeping the commandments. I promise you, in the name of the Savior, relief will come in the timetable of the Lord. Healing also requires time. My invitation today is for all of us to allow the Lord to mold and transform our lives into our potential, to what which our Heavenly Father planned for us. Let us understand our eternal perspective and turn our lives into a beautiful work of art, which was planted by a loving Heavenly Father, who developed a plan of redemption so that we could return to His presence. I bear my sacred testimony that Jesus Christ is our Savior. He gave His life so that we might repent and change, might repent and change and change our character. I testify to you that thanks to His love, it is possible to change. It is possible to leave our weaknesses behind. It is possible to reject the temptations in our lives and develop the attributes of Christ, if and only if we hold unto the iron rod. The Savior Himself showed us the way. He gave us the perfect example and commanded that each of us become as He is. His invitation to us is that we follow Him, that we imitate His example and become as He is. I bear my testimony of this truth in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This BYU devotional address with Elder Ulysses Suarez was given on November 5th, 2013.